Good afternoon, everybody. It's a great pleasure to welcome all of you to the highlight of our ECB annual research conference, which is the Jean Monnet Lecture. We are very pleased and honored that the speaker this year is Professor Roger Meyerson, one of the founders of mechanism design theory. Roger earned his PhD at Harvard. Subsequently, he taught at North Northwestern, and he's currently the David L. Pearson Distinguished Service Professor of Global Conflict Studies in the Harris School of Public Policy at the University of Chicago. Great to have you here. So in 2007, as you all know, he was awarded the Nobel a Memorial Prize in Economic Sciences together with Leonid Hurwitz and uh, Eric Maskin. And incidentally, Professor Maskin delivered the inaugural uh, Jean Monnet lecture during the first ECB annual research conference seven years ago. I would also like to uh, extend a warm welcome uh, to Roger's uh, co-author, Alexandra Keudel, who will also be available to answer your questions after the lecture. Alexandra uh, holds a PhD from the Free University of Berlin. She's an assistant professor at the Department of Public Policy and Governance at the Kiev School of Economics. In her research, she focuses on local democracy, uh, democracy social movements and civic engagement, as well as business political arrangements at the local level in Ukraine. It's a pleasure to also have you here. Mechanism design uh, is a part of game theory that analyzes rules for coordinating people efficiently when they have different information and difficulty in trusting each other. Mechanism design uh, studies which social institutions, that is, which mechanisms, may be expected to maximize social welfare in such situations. And since the theory of mechanism design addresses questions of fundamental importance for society, it has numerous applications in economics and political science, such as regulation, auctions and procurement procedures, the provision of public goods, or social choice and voting rules. And just yesterday, as we also discussed before this talk, Roger gave a seminar at the ECB on uh, bank regulation. The topic of today's lecture will be Ukraine and the role of institutions, namely local governments for post-war reconstruction. Each year, the Jean Monnet Lecture is dedicated to an issue of relevance for strengthening the European Union. More than 18 months after the unjustified invasion of Ukraine by Russia, the future of Ukraine is inextricably linked with the future of the European Union. Roger has extensively spoken and written about the war in Ukraine, including about the role of propaganda and disinformation in sustaining Russia's aggression, as well as about the post-war reconstruction of Ukraine. And we are all very much looking forward to hearing your insights about how the European Union, its member states and its citizens can help the Ukrainians to rebuild their country after the war. Not yet. <laughs> Give me a half a minute more. <laughs> As we all know, Jean Monnet was a leader in the reconstruction of Western Europe after the Second World War. Monnet emphasized the importance of institutions or mechanisms in the language of mechanism design theory, especially the importance of European integration. It seems very appropriate that in the midst of another horrible war on the European continent, we will hear a lecture dedicated to Jean Monnet about the role of institutions in the reconstruction after this war. So the lecture will last for about 45 minutes and thereafter we, uh, we will have the chance uh, to discuss all together also with Alexandra for around 25 minutes in the Q&A. So Roger, we are delighted to have you here and we are very much looking for you to, uh, forward to your talk. Thank you, sir. I'm very, very glad. I'm very glad to be invited to, to the, to the uh, ECB's annual research conference, and, and yes, to give a lecture in honor of Jean, of the memory of Jean Monnet. Um, the title sp involves speaking, hopefully, about um, the uh, 
a post-war reconstruction. The war is still going on in Ukraine. It is a country I've gotten to know and love. Uh, I first went to Ukraine in, in 2014 uh, as part of work that I had was doing with 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 um, uh, then Timothy Malovanov, uh, offering suggestions about about de decentralization reforms, which in that old Soviet-style highly centralized system that they had, we, we thought were extremely important. Ukraine demands the best efforts from all of us as it's in, in this time of 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 of. of of, of trouble for them, of terrible, of war and, and great hope. Uh, and, and our efforts, the efforts of this talk are, every, are, are completely joint with Alexandra Koidel, who has, as you say, will be joining us uh, to, sh to share her expertise in the, uh, um, in the question and answer period. Um, I think uh, Jean Monnet, uh, of course, would grieve that, that the shadow of war now hangs over over, over, over Europe and, and afflicts a great country in Europe, um, even after so much of his grand vision for a peaceful united Europe had been realized. Uh, but I hope he would appreciate that we should begin, indeed, with uh, something, uh, drawing some lessons from the uh, post-war reconstruction after the World War II in, 1940, in the 1940s, late 1940s. Um, so I want to start, I think, and I, I think I learned from uh, Brad DeLong and Barry Eichengreen's 1991 study of, uh, of the effect of the Marshall Plan uh, uh, that, 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 that the, it was that much significantly more uh, uh, effective at, at, at promoting growth than the simple transfer of resources and capital in a growth model could explain. And, and the conclusion we draw from that is that foreign reconstruction assistance is most effective when it supports reforms that will be vital for future development, which means that a donor needs to think about what reforms will be important for future development. It is up to the people of the country to decide what forms they will have, but, 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 but a donor in giving money can, 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 uh, uh, can, can encourage. Uh, for Europe in 1948, the key reforms were, um, were reducing barriers to international trade and increasing e economic cooperation among the nations of Europe. You should know that perhaps the best thing about the Marshall Plan, perhaps the best thing the United States ever did in its foreign assistance work, was to, to announce that something like $20 billion over a certain period of time would be made available to the people of Europe to help them with reconstruction. But the United States refused to say how it should be divided among the countries of Europe and insisted that the nations of Europe themselves should have a conference to make that decision. And this was, of course, a very productive conference. And the, the success of that conference and the Marshall Plan that followed generated public support for more such conferences, leading to a variety of other international agreements. And, and the whole story of, 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 of the rise of the European Union and, and the coming of the Monetary Union, in, which, who's, who's in, in whose citadel we are now located, is, uh, is, is, is a very long and complex one. But it, it, I think it, we can say it begins with that stimulation uh, of, of well-chosen uh, U.S. Uh, foreign aid plans. So there is now today in Ukraine, uh, in, in the EU, decision, decisions being made about the, the planning a, an, aid, an aid facility for helping Ukraine. I want to suggest that for Ukraine today, the vital reforms that I think, I think everyone should agree that, that in, in Ukraine and in the world that, uh, that Ukraine, Ukrainian, the people of Ukraine aspire to join the European Union and to the extent that uh, collaboration in, in, with, with the process of absorbing the aid uh, can, can help facilitate that, that's good. E EU integration is one vital reform. A second vital reform I want to argue is strengthening the democratic uh, local self-government institutions, uh, which were created in um, after the 20 after the after the Maidan protests. As I say, affiliation with the EU was a primary motivation for the pop, great popular demonstrations at late 2013 and 2014 in uh, the, uh, the Maidan Revolution of Dignity, and the establishment of democratic local self-government in in Ukraine in. Uh, and, and decentralization of power, of a significant share of power to these locally elected local governments has been a key reform since 2014. You should know right now that between 2015 and 2020, over 10,000 villages uh, that existed as, as, as local political entities with very little funding were, they were, were amalgamated into communities, which are called in Ukrainian hromadas, 
And about four, there are about 1,400 of these chromatas as a result of this consolidation process over five years. And, the, 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 and, they were, and, and a major fiscal reform gave a decentralized a significant part of the Ukrainian national budget to the, um, to the chromatas, giving them a reliable fiscal basis, a hard budget constraint, non-political basis for, 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 their, for their spending. Strengthening democratic local governments, of course, is my main theme today. And, and what, um, what is this? Uh, assistance for Ukraine's defense and reconstruction is an investment in world peace, and as such, is of great value to the donors, as it will be to the, to the recipients. Uh, we should... I want to argue, and I, I can quote an excellent article by Robert Pearson and Michael McFall in the Journal of Democracy 2022, that the best, whatever the Kremlin says, and it says a lot, uh, uh, the fundamental reason for Putin's re aggression against Ukraine has been preventing Ukraine from uh, showing people in Russia how democracy can succeed in a kindred Slavic country uh, that is close both culturally and geographically. Putin's armies could be, could be militarily defeated, and if, if, if Ukraine was left in ruins thereafter, Putin's ultimate war goals, I think, would, would be realized. Uh, so I want to argue that, that, that this is why, not only helping Ukraine defend itself, but also reconstruction will be worth a significant investment by people, taxpayers, for taxpayers in, in, in Europe and America, and it will, will be a good investment by the standards by which we judge defense spending in, in terms of making a better world. I, Ukraine may indeed offer a valuable lesson in democratic development for the world, but I would, and I would argue that the decentralization reforms of 2014 to 2020 should be recognized as a key part of that. But, and this is an important thing to say in an ECB annual research conference, too often, foreign aid has implicitly been a force for centralization of power. There are plenty of empirical studies like William Easterly and others suggesting that maybe foreign aid doesn't, doesn't even help the recipients. And if it doesn't, what's the mechanism of harm that foreign aid does? And the answer I would give, at least in part, is that foreign aid for public spending increases the power of those who can direct this spending, and by our understanding of international rules, sovereign, any sovereign national government can assert its right to regulate foreign aid. Therefore, foreign aid becomes a resource that is controlled by the central government, and, uh, and it strengthens the central government in its, uh, in, in its relations with other, other people in the, and, and, and changes the whole structure of power in a country. And that's so, so I need to start with at least a short review of basic benefits of, of decentralization of power. Uh, why, why, um, why do we think it's important, theoretically? Uh, actually, the first thing I should say is we should recognize that in any country, some of the most powerful people are their national leaders and, and, and centrally connected elites, people with connections to the top center of power in, in, the, in, in a nation. And all of those people have a vested interest in centralizing power, however well-meaning they may be. And therefore, there is very good reason to believe that decentralization of power in, in, is is undervalued and undersupplied. Uh, therefore, academics uh, should, should, might, might, be, might be encouraged to spend a little more time thinking about the potential benefits of political decentralization. Uh, the classic theories emphasize, and then I'll say something about a few other theories that I think are important, and one particularly important in this case. One classic theory is that local, autonomous local governments can fit public policies to local conditions. Uh, and learning from different local policy initiatives can generate uh, positive externalities as communities learn from each other. We'll see that that has been happening and, and Alexandra has been studying it. Uh, on the other hand, one could argue that the central government, uh, central, the, this is not an argument for decentralizing everything, the central government in particular can take account of interregional externalities and that's one of the reasons for centralizing power. What I wanna say about the classical theory is that we should also recognize that in every part of, the, of this, and, and, and any other theory I can think of, the advantages of decentralization always depend on hardening of local budget constraints. 
soft budget constraints that are subject to renegotiation in the, in the, center, in the, in, in the capital, in the central, central national politics, let those who have good connections in central government dominate local politics. Uh, my notes say those. Uh, the word that, let, let's be more specific, in, many, in, in much of Ukraine's experience, we're talking about oligarchs. Uh, oligarchs are people who don't necessarily have to do anything. They may dominate a, a, a district, not because they've, built, they've done anything to build trust, to earn the trust of, of, of many people who live there, but because they have central connections and because through those connections, uh, people in the district get the message that if you want any money from the, from, from the government to do the things that your government is supposed to do for you, first you have to uh, do what the, what, the, what the oligarch says. Uh, and that's, um, that's what happens when, uh, when, when w that's an inevitable consequence of soft budget constraints are possible. I, I want to at least mention that I, I've, part of the reason I'm, I'm here, part of the reason I got involved talking about local government in Ukraine in 2014 as I had theories, one of the things I, I've argued in a, in a paper in 2006 in the Quarterly Journal of Political Science was that autonomous local governments, uh, autonomous, I should say, democratic local governments, lo reduce entry barriers into national politics as successful local leaders can become small, strong competitive candidates for higher office. And you could call this a form of experimentation that national leaders would not want to encourage necessarily. They don't need to, to encourage their um, uh, others who, to, to run for the, to, 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 to show that they can do a better job for the public than, than the current national leadership. Uh, I also have a recent theoretical paper in, 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 in theoretical economics from 2021 about local accountability can provide better incentives for local public investments. As I say, the decentralization reforms ended were in Ukraine in 2020, and there is some evidence of better public services uh, as a result of, of the decentralization of authority. And, and that helps to encourage people to believe that uh, the Ukrainian political system is something that, that, that's good for them and, and maybe to, that they should want to fight to defend it against an invasion and the, to impose Kremlin domination. But another point that I want to argue that's not part of the classical theory of federalism is that decentralization gives local leaders a stake to defend in the state. Uh, when a decentralization of power to people who have earned the trust of, of large parts of their community means that, you, that in every, every part of the country, in every community, you have people, you have potential leader, local leaders who, one, have the trust of, the, of, of many of their community who they can mobilize, a proven ability to mobilize their community in local elections for political action, and secondly, have a stake of power in the state that makes them willing to stand up and defend the state. Uh, uh, people are more willing to fight for a national state when their trusted community's leaders have a positive role in it. Uh, why do people fight? What, what does an economic theorist say about the, the decision to volunteer and risk your life in defense of your country? It's obviously an important one, but for, from an economic theory's rational choice, he's got to deconstruct that, that, that honor to, to a, a sense, among other things, that uh, if you, uh, people should hope, people should understand uh, that, that if they if they defend their country, that the, the, that the, their neighbors uh, they'll, uh, they'll have more they'll be respected and honored for the for the for the risks that they've taken uh, in defense of the state. If that's true, uh, that's that becomes a motivation. But if your community's leaders don't have anything to do with it, then it's not likely to happen. Future rewards and honors for local contributors who help with local de with defense efforts can be promised more credibly by a locally elected mayor than by a central who a locally elected mayor who has to maintain a reputation for reliably rewarding good service from the community than by a centrally appointed governor who might not be here in a couple of years and who in any case is dependent on, on how he's perceived at the center, not on, uh, uh, on, on anything local. This is an important point. Between in, in, in March and April of 2014, a small number of, uh, of lightly armed subversive who are organized and, and disciplined by, by, by Kremlin agents, uh, Kremlin-led agents, uh, subverted local government in, in, in eastern Ukraine in, the, in, in Don, Donetsk and Luhansk, the Donbas. Um, and in 2022, the world saw the Ukrainian people in every part of Ukraine, east and west, rise up to, to and, and take 
personal risks at all levels to, uh, to, to fight off a, 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 a forceful invasion by one of the great, most powerful armies of the world. The extraordinary increase in Ukraine's ability to resist Russian, the Russian invasion between 2014 and 2022 owes, it, it's, it owes much to many things, but I want to argue that a significant factor is the empowerment of democratic local governments. In 2014, Ukraine's government was highly centralized. There were democratic elections for national leadership. And after the Maidan revolution, everybody knew that there would be free elections and that a new government was going to be elected with votes of millions of people in Ukraine. But it was understood that the, the winners were almost surely going to be elected with votes mostly from Western and Central Ukraine, not necessarily from the Donbass area. And then this new government would then take charge of local government in every part of Ukraine. And, uh, uh, and local local leaders in the in the in the in the cities of and towns of, of uh, Donetsk and Luhansk uh, had felt alienated from the future political from the political system and and offered and and, and people who wanted to resist uh, the the subversion of the Kremlin subversion of of their of their government uh, in those areas and there were many of them lacked the kind of authoritative leadership that they needed to to be effective since the decentralization reforms from 2015 to 2020, locally elected mayors have been empowered in every part of Ukraine to provide better public services and leadership for local defense. And so in February and, and since then in 2022, every part of Ukraine had recognized local leaders who had a proven ability to mobilize people in their communities for political action, that's how they won their elections, and who had a stake of, in the state that was worth defending. And almost all mayors have been loyal to Ukraine and therefore targeted, often brutally, by Russian occupiers. Um, the resilience also depends, and, and this is something that my co-author has, has written about. Um, local authorities have innovated uh, in, in the crisis of war since February of 2022 and, and have shared with each other effective strategies to cope with the challenges of war. So that part of the advantages of decentralization have been proven. Poles of trust in the government. If you think people fight for government because they trust it, uh, Ukrainians are famous for saying not, that they're not really all that enthusiastic about trusting their government. Uh, and I'll show you in a moment the, the slide. Actually, I'll show right now. Um, this, this is a series of polls from the axis from, I think, 2003 to 2020. And the dotted line is expression of polls to the national government. And that's how it goes up in election, presidential election years, but basically it's in the 10 to 15 percent range all the time. And the dark lines are, are polls of local government, which is pretty similar up until the 2015 reforms and then goes up. So there's just evidence that if, if trust in government has gone up, it's, it's led by trust in local government and decentralization, other po recent polls, decentralization, along with army reform, which is obviously important in strengthening the country uh, and, and various procurement and digitalization, digitalized transparency of government have, uh, uh, are, are decentralization is considered, is still, is, is, is considered one of the most successful thing of the reforms. Uh, the point is a meaningful accountability of local authority uh, has strengthened legitimacy of government for, for of the whole political system uh, in an important way. And I would argue when I went, first went to Ukraine in 2014, lots of people were afraid that decentralization would weaken the country. They were, uh, if you know the history of, of the Polish Republic that, that, that controlled much of Ukraine in the, in, in, in the, in the 16 and 1700s, um, that we, it was ultimately fatally weakened by a, a, a decentralization system that gave vetoes over national policy to every province. and and. That's not what modern, modern federal decentralization looks like. Uh, and uh, and th those theories, those fears were wrong. I, I, I want to argue that decentralization reforms have strengthened national resilience. Um, corruption is important. Local corruption exists everywhere. Corruption in local politics exists, by the way, in Chicago. And it certainly exists, I, I, I understand, in Ukraine. I can only speak for Chicago personally, but uh, I've heard of plenty of evidence. Um, but I want to say that you, sh you should know that there, in the years since the Maidan Revolution of Dignity in 2014, a strong anti-corruption culture has also developed in Ukraine. And it has developed alongside the development of autonomous local governments. And these two developments are closely interconnected. Responsible local governments have become 
primary objects of residents' demands for better public service, which leads to mobilization of local groups and civil society to, to, to agitate for better government in their municipality. And locally elected officials have become more responsive to voters' suggestions and complaints because they're locally elected and not centrally appointed. Um, but more generally, meaningful anti-corruption policies depend on broad empowerment of citizens, without which leaders could just use any anti-corruption laws you write to selectively punish their opponents. You, people have to be involved. Decentralization has created more opportunities for citizens' involvement in local policy making through formal and informal channels. And from, there are many municipalities have civic councils. The, the process of amalgamating those more than 10,000 villages into the 1,400 hormadas um, brought, a, brought a lot of local political debate that, and people stayed involved. There's also been a lot of peer competition that you can see, there's a web page, Trans, Trans, Transparency International Ukraine, um, from 2017 to 2022 when the war started, was publishing annually uh, rating, rankings of cities' trans, uh, 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 public transparency of government, and uh, these are publicly ranked, number one to whatever, 200 or something among the major cities where they, they that they monitored and uh, municipalities uh, didn't like that weren't low on the list didn't like it and proved and you can just see the steady increase in the, the, the TI says that their their standards stayed the same but the, that the ratings went up because the, the municipalities made reforms they, 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 there was um, local and 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 digital transparency of government has been important in Ukraine it's been a leader in some ways there is now what's called the the dream platform that has been created for 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 publicly transparent monitoring of communities' reconstruction programs, and local and national civil society groups have helped together to develop and monitor these digital, the digital transparency of government. Um, I should say more about the extent and limits of decentralization reform in Ukraine, because that's, you need to understand that. Locally elected officials have been empowered only at the Hromada level, and as I said, there are about 1,400 um, uh, Hromadas in Ukraine, that includes Kiev as one city, uh, one community, but uh, m m many of them are, are, are smaller than 10,000 people. Uh, th the fiscal reform that gave a hard budget constraint to these municipalities, which was absolutely vital to the success of the reform, is that 60% of the locally paid personal income taxes go to the municipalities so that by 2021, local governments were getting about a quarter of all public revenue in Ukraine. Uh, and that hard budget constraint is, is why it worked. Now, there exist locally elected councils in each region. There are 24 oblasts re or regions. And each district, there are now 140 or so, about 140 rayon or in Ukrainian or districts. Uh, but these locally elected councils have no power. The oblast and rayon administrations at the provincial or district level, this is nuts uh, two and three levels in European language talk, um, these administrations have remained branches of the central government under the president. So when I talk about decentralization, I am not talking about empowering the, the provincial governments. Don't get confused. They're, they're doing a good job. They're, 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 I'm not criticizing them. I'm just saying they are part of the national government. We should help the national government of Ukraine. But it's not decentralization. It's, it's, it's distributed, administ centralized administration. Possible reform of rayon and oblast administrations has been discussed. A lot of people in Ukraine want to do it. Um, it remains a question for after the war. It's not going to happen during the war, of course. Uh, I want, I'm willing to say one alternative that I have recommended is keep oblast administrations under central control, letting the prime minister uh, nominate the head of the, the name the head of the, the oblast administration, but devolve rayon administrations, the lower the district administrations, to locally elected councils that should include the local Hromada mayors in, in, in the countryside. Um, Kremlin agents promoted an oblast level separatism in 2014. Uh, in Donetsk and Luhansk that became People's Republics. Those, those are provinces or oblasts. Um, but the rayons, like municipalities, are surely too small to be posed as units of separatism, and therefore I would not worry about it. Uh, so the, the key question, we, I want to argue we, we should be thinking very hard 
about how to design an aid facility for balanced support of national and local authorities. Uh, I am a great fan of President Zelensky, and I think he's, he's, he's leading a great government, but I, think, but I want to argue as a social scientist and as someone who, I'm not a Ukrainian and I don't speak Russian or Ukrainian, so my, my, but, but my, pre, my theoretical prejudice and everything I've been able to read, and I read extensively what's available in English, that's limited, I would suggest as a theorist, as an outsider who cares about their country, that a balanced decentralization, and maybe it's three quarters national government and one quarter local governments, and that's, that's what they chose, and that's, that, that, you can do that. But uh, the balanced uh, of power between national and local authorities of, in some way is, um, uh, uh, is, is, is good for the people of Ukraine, and, will, will be, and, and if Ukraine is to be a successful growing country in, in decades to come after peace, uh, uh, I believe it's more that that, that that is going to happen be, because of the decentralization and is, more like, is less likely if, if the decentralization is curbed. We are talking, the, the destruction of this war by Russian missiles and armies is, is immense. Uh, es, estimates of how much it's going to cost to, um, to rebuild Ukraine are one to, f I see one to five or six times annual GDP of the country. This is a lot of money. And I'm also arguing that, that something, some, th some part of that, which is a lot of, of this lot of money, is a good investment for both Europeans and Americans to share uh, on, uh, on, on the standards by which we, we judge defense spending, um, and all, as well as a good thing to do. But uh, foreign aid, so immense amounts of foreign aid going to Ukraine over the next five, over five, five to ten years after after um, after the end of the war, this could become a force for centralization because foreign aid, as I've noted before, has often been an implicit force for centralization of power. Now, even with foreign funding, even if it's paid for by the taxpayers of the United States of America and the European Union and other countries. Um, Public spending in Ukraine must be directed by the people's elected representatives. Foreigners can, can offer the money, and they can offer the money with some conditions, but, they can't, but the money can only be spent in ways that Ukraine's elected representatives direct. But the president is not the only elected representative of the people of Ukraine. He is a, the most important elected representative. He, he deserves the most say in how the money is. He and his offices. His office does deserve the most say, but mayors are also elected by the people of Ukraine, and it's it's not wrong for the for the for the for the EU to to let mayors and their and their Hromada town councils uh, take some share of the power in directing that money. A, T a Transparency International Ukraine in, a poll in in the spring of 2023 found divided views about which institutions should have final responsibility for the results of of uh, reconstruction spending. The, the largest number, more than half, said local authorities, people evidently could check more than one box, in, m meaning quite rationally that they wanted uh, the, the, the aid to be divided among, and the responsibility for the aid to be divided among local government and national government. The president got almost a half. The central executive, which means the prime minister and his ministers, uh, got a slightly smaller half, and then the national legislature uh, got, got, got 46 percent. Um, to design aid programs that appropriately support national and local authorities, donors should talk not just to the national government, but also to the local governments. They should solicit, solicit mayors' views. There are three associations are of, of the Ukrainian cities. There's Association of Ukrainian Cities, there's Association of, uh, National Association of Ukrainian uh, Romadas, and, uh, and, and uh, uh, these associations have leadership. They don't represent, you know, that, and, and the EU people who are planning the EU facility can get a good start on finding out what they think. Well, let me just say, I am here to, to say what local government is important. They are the, mo the, primary, the, the mayors, certainly are the number one experts. The people of Ukraine have something to say about it also. That's why I, I quoted the TI Ukraine poll. But, uh, but if, if anything I say is contradicted by, what, by, by consulting the, the, the representatives of the, of, the, of the Association of Ukrainian Cities or one of the other organizations, they're right, and I'm wrong, and I, I concede it. Uh, but, I but I want to suggest uh, some, some, some things that they might be asking for. If they need, that's a good start. That's only the beginning. 
The, 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 the Ukraine facility should have local offices at least in every province, in every oblast, uh, maybe even in every district if, you, if you're willing to do it, to help local authorities plan projects and manage them with appropriate controls. They need help. The Dream platform is up and there are very few uh, proposals going on to it because, they, uh, because mayors of small towns need a lot of help learning how to fill out the forms to make a, a good proposal for, uh, for funding. Staffing field offices to support the development of, pro of municipalities' project management capabilities is an investment in strengthening local self-government, it's an investment in strengthening Ukraine, and it's an investment worth paying for. The, the European Union already has a program called You Lead. It's co jointly sponsored by the EU as a whole and several member nations. Germany, I think, and Sweden are important in it. I put up their website. They already have regional offices. Uh, is the Ukraine facility planning to t expand, to, to take, to, to join, to, to take over those offices and, ex and enlarge them? That would be entirely appropriate. Uh, I have no idea where this discussion is going on. I would argue that some fraction of foreign aid and uh, I've, I, I, I'll toss, just toss out a number, a quarter. Why do I say a quarter? That, I say some fraction of foreign aid, perhaps a quarter, could be budgeted for allocation by mayors. And then locally elected officials work, and that, that quarter of, of foreign aid uh, could be, by some simple form, reasonable formula, could be sub, subdivided into target uh, totals of grants for each district of Ukraine. And you can take into account population and, and damage and war, whatever else you want in those formulas. And then the, a local aid, uh, um, local aid officer working out of the facility's local, local office uh, could work with the, uh, the mayors in, in each district to try to work out a plan. Um, the, the, the aid officer could encourage the local mayors to cooperate in developing a joint plan for local reconstruction in the district, or they could just figure out reasonable ways to divide it up among projects proposed by the various municipalities. The key is that the budget should not be dependent on national political approval, because remember, a soft budget constraint means it's ultimately up to central control. Um, and, the, this, and, and perhaps uh, in some, some districts, uh, the, the people of Ukraine might get a, an opportunity to see what locally accountable district level uh, authorities can, can do for, for them, just as the people of Europe in 1948 got to see what uh, international assistance, what international cooper economic cooperation could do for the people, for, for them. Uh, the, the, oh, there's the, that's the poll. I, I, it's too small to read, so I'll go on. Let me say something important, a sidebar on, on the structure of aid, uh, Grant. We sh you should recognize generous loans. I believe that okay. the, the the current draft document that one can read online uh, of for the for the EU aid facility has words like 78% is going to go to the what they call pillar one, which is the aid to Ukraine, and it'll be in the form of non-repayable financial support and loan support. I guess non-repayable financial support probably means grants. And, uh, and loan support means loans that you have to repay. Okay, I, uh, I don't, it doesn't say, I didn't find anything where it said what the mix was going to be. Generous loans, which means, you know, long-term and low interest, and, you know, it's, it's really great to get this loan because it's better than what you can get, at, anybody could get at a bank. The generosity of those loans reinforce centralization when leaders, when lenders, I should say, uh, require national guarantees, which is pretty standard in, in the development world, in the international development assistance world. Because then approval of loans becomes a valuable resource which is controlled by the central authorities. And I do know of stories in Kenya and elsewhere where, the, where, of, where, where, where it seems like a really good program actually is bad because the, the key question was in the capital they made the decision of actually who got the, the, the anyway, who got the aid and, uh, then it, and that's really where the control was. So we have to watch for the soft budget constraint. Local credit worthiness could be promoted by a, a law in a non-political way that enables municipalities to pledge some fraction of their future personal income tax revenues. But if, if that's a significant fraction, then we raise the possibility that foreign aid in some t town somewhere could, let, could end up allowing some corrupt officials mortgage the future of their, their town's future revenues, then running away with the proceeds 
and uh, the result being that those towns are left ruined without any means for, for recovery because they've, they've lost their future revenue. So that, there's, a, there's a limit to how far I want to go in, uh, we should think about going, there's real reasons not to go too far in, in, in generating credit, in just saying the towns are credit worthy for these loans. The risks of such harm can be minimized by assisting local governments with grants, which of course can be matched by local contributions from their current revenue. I should say that if, if we learned anything from the post-World War I uh, settlement of Europe after, in 1919, it's the shell games of creating debts to write off later can have real costs, and that's a point I shouldn't have to emphasize any further in Germany. The European Union provides grants to local governments in disadvantaged regions of Europe. Ukraine is the one part of Europe to have been invaded and bombed for applying to join the EU. Uh, so although Ukraine has not yet been admitted to the European Union, perhaps Ukraine's local authorities could be treated as parts of a very disadvantaged region of Europe, and in terms of repayment, they want to sign up and start paying taxes to the European Union as soon as they can. So uh, um, let me say, I think it's important, and I've tried to argue it's important for the, the, the Ukraine facility of the European Union, this, 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 this institution which, which is, is, is being planned to mediate aid at least from the European Union and perhaps also, uh, I'm willing to go home and, and, tell, and, and advocate that the, the United States should channel its aid through, through it as well, but, but that'll, that's a Washington decision. Uh, but um, let me say something about the, 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 the advantages, the many advantages of donors working with local and national officials. First of all, if the EU's aid facility is, which is a network of, 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 of staff officers working for, 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 the, for the European Union, if they, are, if they are themselves working regularly both with national officials and local officials, then they're, they're going to be more able to monitor how well aid is used at each level because the communication with, with local mayors is likely to, to generate complaints about abuse of, of funds that were given to the national government, and the national government has anti-corruption bodies which are going to be actively looking at, at, at potential corruption by, by, the, by, the, uh, by the, the local governments, both of which will, in a big country, occur with po probability one somewhere and maybe in many places, but, um, the political autonomy, the separation of powers, the separation of accountability means that, e that it's easier, it's easier to, for, 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 for somebody who works for the president to complain about uh, his, what, to, uh, what he sees about corruption at, at some of the mayor than, than to complain about somebody else who, who also works for the president. Um, of course, uh, the monitoring of corruption, the, the, the donors can and should monitor corruption. They sh ultimately, they should be working with anti-corruption bodies in Ukraine at all times, and any information about abuse of, of resources is, should be shared with the, with the, with the, the proper, proper Ukrainian authorities, but uh, better monitoring is good for the donors' goals, and it's good for Ukraine. Um, even with the best oversight, contractors should, express, should expect profits for managing risks. We're talking about enormous projects, uh, norm and political leaders uh, may steer lucrative projects to business people whom they've relied on, whether that's corruption or just uh, wanting to make sure the job gets done but well by somebody who I know uh, I can rely on. Uh, either way, um, we should expect Contractors, and they should be contractors in Ukraine. We don't need to enrich people in, 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 in the beltway around Washington, D.C., or in, 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 in other, con other countries to, uh, to, to rebuild Ukraine. The, the Ukrainians can do it with our help. Um, uh, but either way, we should expect, even without any corruption, a lot, a lot of business people will make a lot of money on, 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 uh, on the reconstruction. If it's all done through the president's office, then we should expect a, a, the relatively small number of business people who have um, good connections with that office will make the most money. We'll make, and, and even if they're not the current class of recognized oligarchs of Ukraine, it is very possible that the post-war recovery period could become known in Ukrainian history as the birth of the second cohort of Ukrainian oligarchs. Uh, and that's not been good for the country. Uh, 
aid that's steered to the localities that's, that's, that's controlled by and, and allocated by and directed by uh, the, uh, the municipalities. Yeah, it's going to go. Uh, some of the best contracts are going to go to business people who have connections with their mayors. But I believe that that is likely to be thousands of business people all scattered all across Ukraine. And, if, and that class of business people will be much less destructive than, uh, than, than, than four or five uh, well-connected in the center. Uh, there are other things. Burdens of foreign reporting should not be so t such as to disqualify anything the locally trusted suppliers. And uh, again, I've got a note here that about the, the, soft, the dangers of the soft budget constraint. If the allocation of funds to one locality uh, depend on, to a locality's projects depend on a central government office allocating them, then even if it looks like it's being done by, by local planners, the local planners could be pressed uh, to use contractors who have connections at the center. And it's, that's why it's important that the U European facility should think through how much money do we want to send to these different areas of Ukraine? Maybe not every Hromada, but at least every district. Uh, disaggregate gu guidelines at the district level so that the, the mayors at the district level should be, have some confidence in, that, that, that among themselves they'll be able to divide money uh, that, that the European Union is making available to them without necessarily worrying about uh, pleasing a specific agency in, 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 in Kiev. They have to obey the laws of the country, they have to be, uh, but they don't have to, to do politics. We, donors' fiscal controls should support, not displace, accountability to the people of Ukraine. Local civil society can be more meaningfully involved in, lo in locally directed projects. Let me say as a general theoretical point that yes, I understand that promoting civil society, which is, is, is common, a common mantra in the development communities is a worthy goal. I support that. But foreign supported civil society groups uh, may ultimately become accountable only to foreign donors. I guess you could go to Somalia if you want a good, good example of that. Civil society can be supported through its involvement with elected local governments. And in Ukraine, you have elect local governments that are accountable to their people through a process of free election. I've argued also the people of Ukraine deserve an opportunity to see what locally elected officials can do to provide public goods at the rayon district level and a cooperation in some districts among the mayors in, in organizing a district-wide plan. Uh, if, if the European Union facility can encourage that, that would do that. And I've argued that that's similar to what the American, what, what, Mar what General Marshall did for Europe when he insisted that, that the Europeans divide the money at the international level. One last important point. There's a terrible war going on in Ukraine as I speak, and it's nice to talk about post-war reconstruction, and, and, and I hope that that time may be, may be not so far away. But while democracy is limited by war in Ukraine, we understand that many of the forms of democracy may need to be curtailed. They may not hold elections. They may suspend certain forms of public reporting that are part of good transparent government if they, if they think that, that, that some of that reporting can also help the Russian invaders. So there's a problem with democracy and war, and, and the people and governments of, of Ukraine are going to work that out. But while democracy is necessarily limited by, by the full-scale war in Ukraine, the national leaders support for engagement, for donors' engagement with local governments can be a vital expression of the national leader's commitment to constitutional democracy. So I would urge President Zelensky and his office to consider that the European Union can set up mechanisms to talk to mayors only if Ukrainian law allows uh, foreign donors to do that. And uh, I don't know, I'm not an expert on what it says in Ukrainian law, but the, they. The national government should not stand it away, but, but if it's good for the Ukrainian people, they should do what's good for the Ukrainian people. Uh, decentralizing something like 25% of the funds uh, that the European Union was going to offer by, to, 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 to local government support is, is consistent with the balance of, of, of the fiscal balance that the Ukrainians' politics has already negotiated, and so it's not it, we can hope that it's not disturbing that balance adversely, but it is 25% less than the 100% that uh, the president could, and the president's office could dream about allocating if they insisted. Uh, and uh, um, I would argue they should not insist, and they should uh, they they should great they should graciously offer invite 
uh, the European Union and the United States and other do major donors to have some fraction, not a majority, but some fraction of assistance negotiated directly with, uh, made available for direct grants to the, um, to the, to the constitutionally elected local governments. Uh, so let me, without prior political approval from the center. So let me conclude and say, first of all, post-war reconstruction of Ukraine should aim to fulfill its people's hope for a better future for which they have given so much. Uh, that, uh, I, that, I don't know how to say that. that those are just words, but they, that's, that's everything. Decentralization reform has been a key component, I have argued, in Ukraine's democratic promise. Ukraine's recent history has shown how democratic decentralization can help to increase people's trust in government, broaden government's accountability to civil society, and strengthen national resilience against an armed invasion of the worst sort. Local self-government in Ukraine, how it did the last is that local self-government in Ukraine has ensured that every part of the country has local leaders who can mobilize people in their communities, that's how they got elected, and have a stake in the state that is worth defending, and that has made a difference, I've argued. Uh, democratic development in Ukraine can indeed be a model for other nations to emulate, and I'm sorry that, that the Kremlin has worried that it would be a model that would make it harder for them than the Kremlin to rule Russia, the Russian people as autocrats. So Putin's goal of war goal of preventing this could be achieved if, if, even if Putin's armies are defeated, if Ukraine thereafter is left in ruins. Uh, and so post-war recovery assistance should be valued also as an investment in the defense of peace and democracy for others in Europe and throughout the world. Decentralization, but let me, say, let me emphasize at the very end that decentralization reforms are a domestic development in Ukraine. I, I was going there as, as, as a foreign expert in 2014 to advocate it. The way they did it is completely different from the way I was recommending. I, you know, that, I don't have any, I was, just, I was just watching. It was done by people in Ukraine, but there has been foreign assistance. There have been programs such as ULEAD, where, which have and matched and, and the Congress of Regions of the Council of Europe um, that have enabled new Ukrainian cities to learn how to do democratic municipal government from, from other countries in Europe, uh, which have longer traditions of democratic municipal government. But foreign assistance can provide valuable assistance when donors provide, when donors actively work with local authorities. So to support Ukraine's resilience, both in the war and in post-war recovery, I would argue that aid donors in, in EU's Ukraine facility should reach out to the locally elected local governments as, and treat them as full partners with funding and authority to plan and direct local recovery efforts. Thank you. So thank you so much, Roger, and I'm also glad to welcome Alexandra uh, now here on stage. So if I may, I would like to ask two short questions. In the meantime, you can think about your, your questions. Um, and uh, of course, Alexandra can also uh, come in if, if she likes. So my, my first point is the following. I mean, you, uh, you argued quite convincingly that part uh, of the aid should be given to local uh, authorities. Uh, and also that uh, kind of aid should be given in a way that promotes further uh, development. Yes. And so when I think about that, I mean, I, I, I would probably think of this aid being used for things like building, I mean, local capacity, yes. because that <clears> is something that is, uh, is very important. And that also when you think about this question, centralization versus decentralization, there's often uh, also a bit of a lack of, of competence at the local level, and this has to be built. And so for this, you need money. But this kind of seems to be a bit in a tension with what you said at another point of your talk, which was that uh, kind of the, how the money is used should be up to the, uh, entirely to the, uh, uh, to the elected representatives. So how can we combine uh, the two? I was, I was, I was saying that, yes, I, I, look, there, there are schools and local roads that, uh, that need to be improved and, 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 and local clinics, uh, 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 that all of which have in some measure been destroyed in different parts of, 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 of this country because of the war. Um, and 
I of course anticipate that, 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 that but it's up to the mayors. Of course, the, 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 local, the locally elected local people have, are going to make the shopping list of what they most want to rebuild for any given fixed amount of money that they can get uh, tomorrow. Uh, and I would assume, as I say, a school is going to be, is, is maybe, maybe we're on it. Um, the, um, yeah, maybe my point is it's not it's not necessarily they're going to make a that given. Decision. There are that big things. Look, the port, uh, rebuilding port facilities in Odessa, rebuilding bridges and major highways that that, that, that that enable the communication. That that's the kind of thing you want the national government to be to be. Having. I'm saying that any public goods that it's that certainly the EU should not be deciding which schools to build, but they can decide. And 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 local governments are going to are going to have local public goods that they. Uh, that they want to build. I would argue that I believe that in many parts of rural Ukraine, um, hospitals will be something that exists not at the Hromada level. Every every Hromada doesn't have its own hospital. It'll be at a district level, uh, and therefore, but it's clearly a local public good, and the people of, of that region will understand how they would prior, prioritize repairing and rebuilding the hospital versus other other things that they want. Uh, the fact that there that there is no local accountability for executive authority at a high, any level higher than the municipality is why I think it might be very helpful to have some degree of cooperation be uh, at, at a, among the the, lo, the the mayors and their and their local town councils um, be encouraged by the EU's aid officers in order that they might identify we would prefer if we share with several other municipalities the rebuilding of a clinic which will be located in only one of us but will serve all of us. If that's the way they feel, they should be able to do it and they shouldn't be. And will that clinic be, otherwise that clinic is, has to be done at the national level. And we're talking about a clinic in a district and you know, maybe one of the harder to get to districts in rural Ukraine. Is that gonna be on the top of the shopping list in Kiev? That's, and will it depend only on political connections uh, in, in the president's office to get a particular region, particular district's uh, clinic to come. That's the kind of thing I was thinking about. Maybe let me add uh, a, few, yeah. a few more points on the tension between the capacity of the municipalities and the, uh, giving them the autonomy to decide what they need. We should uh, differentiate between uh, capacities, uh, the, ur uh, the capacities of urban municipalities and rural municipalities. In the urban settings, uh, it's about uh, more than 100 cities, actually. It's a lot of people. And um, uh, they started to build a so-called city institutes, which are municipal offices, municipal enterprises for uh, project management. And uh, these entities have uh, been able to uh, mobilize foreign funding for the projects uh, way before the full-scale invasion. So the, the capacities are there. And uh, what is happening now in the regions is that this, uh, city, so let's call them city institutes for, for the simplification. They started going, uh, let's, uh, if they are located in Lviv, they started going to the municipalities in the Lviv region in order to help them design the development uh, project plans. There are also an uh, interesting story. One such agency has been relocated because of the Russian full-scale invasion now to a city in the central Ukraine, and they are helping now the authorities in the smaller municipalities e exactly to do that, design the, the project plans with which they could apply for, for the funding. And on top of that, uh, Ukraine has a very strong civil society to which I also uh, put my academic institution, uh, Kiev School of Economics, which is not common. Uh, that in, uh, I know in the, in the EU, academia tends to be a part, but in Ukraine, we are a part of the resistance, resilience and recovery. And what we have done, uh, we have piloted a four-month training on project management for hromadas of uh, 20,000 uh, people and less. And what I see is a great desire to learn. They may not be able to fill out the ECB forms <laughs> tomorrow, but let's say they will be able to apply for projects which can be made accessible to this kind of size, right? So it is also a step on the side of the <coughs> donors that should uh, account for, for this and not disregard the, the smaller municipalities as incapable. And uh, if there is a possibility, and what we have would like to do as our next step, we will um, unite our training with the real funding from the donors so that our trainees, which were project teams, 
that they will be able to then use it for for the for the funding and i think in the pillar 3 in the capacity building of the U ukraine facility it is a space to put such kind of instruments exactly to resolve the tensions that you've been uh, speaking about thank you very much so i would like to open the floor for questions i think we have someone with a mic right So, who would like to ask a question? Okay, people are, th are still thinking, so I ask my second question. Good, please. <laughs> I mean, I can ask more questions. There are many, many please. interesting aspects in your, in your speech. So, the, uh, you mentioned that uh, the, the current support to uh, Ukraine is a good investment. Yes. So uh, how sure are you that this is kind of the official view of the, uh, of the US under any administration? Oh. <laughs> I am more uncertain. You asked that. I was hoping you would ask a question that I could defer to Alexandra, but, but, uh, but I, I, I cannot dodge a question about American politics. And I'm, I'm I, sorry. I have more variance <laughs> about, about the future of, 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 of the United States of America than I've ever had in my life, and I'm an old man. Um, it's, no, it's, 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 of course, extremely uncertain. Uh, I think, the, look, the, the Republican Party has a long history of being uh, the party that was di more distrustful of, of, of Russia um, and stronger on national, more willing to spend money on national defense issues. So, uh, but this is a different Republican Party. Time, times have changed. I think many, many in the Republican leadership do, uh, I, still understand the importance of supporting Ukraine. Uh, I suspect most people in the Republican Party who are uh, attacking the, the whole idea of aiding Ukraine are doing so because there's a Democratic administration that is responsible for foreign policy and the, and the Democratic administration is doing it. And if a Democratic administration is doing it, then they want to criticize. So I'm not sure that if, if there were a change in, um, in a party control after the next election, which is certainly possible, and I worry, I have, I, I have strong feelings about that. Um, but uh, if it happens, I still wouldn't necessarily assume that uh, that American Policy towards you, American policies would change, but I don't. But I think it's possible that support would would remain. It's also possible that there would be a complete uh, change of the of, of the of the. I'm not sure which which betrayal of by, of, by an, an ally of uh, of. of um, I don't know. Uh, when Russia's when Russia changed changed sides in the. Uh, the war, the, the war, the Third Silesian War was a, it was a big surprise to, 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 uh, with this change of succession. I don't know. It, it's, 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 I, like, it's, but it's, it, it's shocking to the Allies, and, and, and we, you have to, it is something worth worried about. I, I think it's a small probability event, but it's possible. And I today, I just saw the uh, re, the uh, public opinion poll in the U.S. that the majority still support yes. uh, support yes. support support to Ukraine. So it's a good okay. so sign. Um, the, you remember the numbers? Uh, unfortunately not. Yeah. I, I just yeah. Look, but maybe we should also think um, how do we maintain uh, Germany's and the EU support to yes. Ukraine because there are enough um, actors uh, in, especially on the right radical side of the political spectrum in Germany and elsewhere in the EU who actively try to go against this and uh, maybe it is time for the EU not always also to look at the support of the United States and um, maintain its position based on that, but develop its own vision for the for the foreign policy. And here, I think Roger's point that this is an investment in own security is uh, very strong. And I have to say, currently I'm based in Stockholm and um, at the Södertörn University. And in Sweden, there is no question that this is a, a matter of their security. So you can speak to anybody on the street, you can speak to anybody in the academia, there's a very very clear understanding that the, it is a matter of their security, not because they will be attacked or anything, but because they understand Russia is trying to uh, to 
kill their, institu their, their democratic institutions from within with uh, cyber attacks, with funding right-wing uh, right populists and so on and so forth. And um, why do we not see that in Germany? So that is like a very good starting point where we should also discuss that and not always look at the United States. No, no, I, I think, think you're, uh, yeah, you're no. perfectly <laughs> right. But uh, I mean, let me assure you that very large parts of Germany uh, understand that uh, very well. Yeah. I think, look, the, the Kremlin wants to divide the, the, the allies who are supporting Ukraine and they'll work for it, by, but they, hope, they have hopes for it by, in American politics, they hope for it in other countries. Uh, we, we've seen in the last couple of, last week or so, uh, the success of their Black Sea blockade on Ukrainian grain. The Ukraine has been feeding a very large fraction of humanity in mainly in Africa and the Middle East. Uh, and and with the Black Sea, when the when when you, when when Russian blockade prevents that from being exported, the obvious thing is to send it through Europe. And an obvious thing, I guess, is is to let it stop early in Europe and then have the grain, the, the Polish and German grain go, go, let's send it. It's closer to, to Atlantic ports that can, can, where you can send it to Africa, but that changes the profits. And now, uh, so the Polish uh, and, 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 and Hungarian uh, res resistance to, to uh, refusal to import, uh, to allow the import of, of Ukrainian grain is exactly what the Kremlin wanted. Uh, I think you know better than I, and I would. I, I certainly remember a day when, 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 when the European Union was only in the western part of Europe, and people, knowledgeable Europeans, expressed to me a doubt that uh, that the, the German farmers and French farmers would ever tolerate the the accession of Polish agricultural exporters into the European Union. It happened, and the, and and I think everyone's glad that that it happened in the end, but. Uh, we're talking about Ukraine joining the European Union at some point. Everybody's saying that the EU leadership is certainly hoping for it, uh, saying it's, it's not now. But, and when it comes, Ukrainian grain could come into European markets and the other producers of grain will have, will have competition. Uh, so why is, I do not understand why this has happened. Um, but it's giving the Kremlin exactly what it wants, a, uh, a breakup uh, in, in willingness to support Ukraine for reasons that, that, that don't detract from the original argument that the world will be a very much worse place if the Kremlin achieves its goal. Yeah. So uh, you've also worked on, uh, on Russian propaganda. So oh. what, what do you think is the, uh, the role of Russian propaganda in the strengthening of uh, right-wing uh, parties in, in Europe who also uh, often uh, uh, oppose the support uh, of Ukraine? I, I, I don't think I can comment on that. I th I'm sure that, look, I know in my country, they, they've done clever things that, 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 that influenced politics, but uh, uh, at some point in, in 2016, we started learning how to read a web page or, or, you know, or, or, or a Twitter post to recognize something that had been written by someone whose primary language was Russian uh, into bad English uh, and, uh, and was you know, disinformation campaigns. Um, I, I have been, look, the, I, the number one thing I have said about Russian propaganda is that they are trying to mobilize the Russian people by telling them that um, that NATO, that the West has a conspiracy to destroy Russia. Uh, that is, that, that Ukraine, and Ukraine joining into, a mili into an alliance with, with Europe and America is an existential threat to Russia. That is not true. And one of the proofs that it's not true is precisely the things people have been complaining about, uh, that American aid, for example, has, has held back weapons that have cost lives in Ukraine precisely because the, Ameri the U.S. government did not want to supply Ukraine with weapons that could be used for an offensive action against Russia, because we have no interest in that. Uh, I think my question is, is there anything that, I, well, not my question, I, I think Putin is able to control the, the media that people watch in Russia, and Putin is quite capable, and the Kremlin is quite capable of lying to the Russian people. I've seen lies on Russian state TV, 
uh, regularly, uh, but that doesn't mean we should stop trying to send the message regularly that this is a war for, that, 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 that our interests, the U European Union and, and the United States government should regularly try to communicate that, to, that there is no interest in, in weakening Russia, there's only an interest in defending the, the rights of a nation, Ukraine, to have its sovereign independence and democratically elected government, uh, and that the principle of protecting that is something that's worth a lot to us, because the world will be a much worse place if countries, if we set the precedent that countries can get away with it, doing what, what, what Putin did in February 2022. But the, and so I just, I've called for doing whatever we can to send the message uh, of, restra of restraint, even while helping the, the Ukrainian people to defend themselves. So Luke would like to ask a question, and then Klaus. Thank you. So Luke Laven, ECB. So first I want to say I am very proud to work for an organization that devotes an entire session of one of its flagship events to Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, so the question I have is as follows. Um, I, I completely subscribe to, to the main argument you put on the table here, Roger. But having worked for one of these foreign aid institutions in the past that will be greatly involved in this whole endeavor, um, I think there's an important wrinkle, which is that these institutions have their own constraints and capacity constraints in particular that lead them to favor uh, large projects and to go through central governments. Yes, yes. Um, you mentioned that yeah. typically they require state guarantees that are at federal level, um, but they also have their own incentives, uh, the, often because of capacity constraints, to divide up this pot of money, and it will be a very large pot of money among a few very large projects. And so I was thinking whether, uh, given all of this, there, there will be a lot of reluctance on the donor side to go with any plan that yeah. will reach out directly to the municipal level, whether you could think with your game theory hat of yeah. another mechanism where, yes, the money goes to the federal level, but there's an automatic mechanism which, that would be triggered where it would go then immediately to oblast or lower level. Obviously, part of why I want to, want to give, the, give this talk, why I greatly appreciate the opportunity to speak at this important economic institution of Europe about this, this, this question is because raising the, the understanding that uh, there could be adverse effects to doing what's, what seems easiest in the short run. And, and you, you have said, well, I didn't say that one of the biases is simply uh, foreign aid likes to have one office that, that, that they can go to to, author, to authorize everything they do, and that, that just simplifies things. Um, uh, I think it's why in, 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 in reconstruction, of when countries make a transition to, to democracy, uh, foreign aid, when there's foreign aid involved, it, it, they typically try to first elect a national government, and then that national government does, has a vested interest in not decentralizing power. and. Uh, uh, but the one country in, in, in Africa, Somaliland, that's not recognized by anybody and therefore gets no foreign aid has, has its own problems, but, they, but, but they've had a great advantage that the first thing they did was elect local governments, then they elected a president, and then they elected a legislature. They did it in the, the right order. Uh, um, the, uh, um, they did it in the order the United States did it in, and uh, for example, in its history, uh, which had local governments before, uh, elected 100 years before there was ever a national government. But, far, but there is a bias. So, so first of all, I'm trying to suggest as a theorist that that's, that's, that's a start. Um, I think what, it, I think the best mechanism, you, you, if, 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 the, if the allocation formula is reasonably mechanical and reasonably transparent uh, and objective, then, um, a formula can be approved by the national government that then is, is really is creating hard budget constraints. Um, the, uh, there are many countries that, that 
uh, that have centralized collection of revenue and decentralized allocation, and, and, and they have to negotiate the formulas on a base, on regular basis, but, but as long as they do that and, 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 the, and there are no, the, the, the number of, of uh, the percent of wiggle room that you have for, for politically, politically subjective de determinant uh, factors is, is minimized, then politics, national politics is taken out of the process. One of the ways to do that is for the EU to itself say, here is the money that we want to go to, to local municipalities, and here's how we anticipate it being distributed. As I say, I can't imagine it being distributed with a number for every chromata, but I can imagine it going to the, to the, to the districts. There's enough dis statistics about that. And once it's at the district level, cheating, the, the, you know, certainly if one can imagine a conspiracy to, to, to steal the benefits from everybody by saying, we're gonna, we have control over, with, with this, this cabal, this conspir set, uh, conspiracy has control over which Ramadas are gonna get how much, and you're all gonna have to give back to us the, the, you know, the corrupt cabal uh, in order to get, get any share at all, or we'll give it to the other one. Uh, and we know where the, where the equilibrium bid in that one is. They go, they go to epsilon, they go to almost zero. Um, I have they, also they, suggestion yeah. from so, experience so, of... So that, those, are, those are formulas. I should, I should defer to, to Alexander, can you hold because it? Because yeah. I think I would have an empirical um, evidence for something that you described that had worked in Ukraine. It is an education subvention. Uh, after the so along the decentralization reform, there has been also sectoral decentralization. Ukrainian municipalities are responsible for maintaining the schools. So teachers are paid by the government as government employees. The schools, have walls, and so on—that is the municipal responsibility. And based on a very long formula, which you all will definitely really like, because it has even uh, criteria like whether the municipality is located in the mountain region or flat region, how many kilometers is there between the schools, um, how, uh, how many children with disabilities there are, and the lots, lots, lots of other criteria. They have calculated how many, uh, based also on the amount of teachers and uh, students, of course, and the um, model size of the uh, of the class that it cannot be between uh, can be less than 28 but not more than i think 35 but i may be wrong here and so based on this formula the state subvention for the municipal budgets for the education has been um, distributed that's why one of the ways could be to look at how this has been done and uh, i i had a, i had a, a chance to talk with the ministry of finance people who worked on this formula, so it, it looked like there has been a lot of thought. And what is good, it has been upgraded after every year to learn from the mistakes from, from the past. So it is one chance. But also, as a political scientist, I can, cannot argue for completely removing politics from these decisions, uh, because it, we are living in political world. And one of the ways is to ensure that there is a between municipal levels, a, a district, regional, and the national government, that there are meaningful feedback loops regarding any decisions that are being there to be made. And uh, the European Union actually played a critical role in the facilitating such dialogue when the uh, municipalities were being amalgamated and when they were, because they could amalgamate voluntarily, but these plans had to be approved at the uh, regional level. And uh, the, uh, uh, the EU, actually facilitated all of this. So it, it is very much in the position of the EU now also to be this actor of facilitation that can put uh, all stakeholders, and all stakeholders I mean municipal authorities, I mean regional authorities, central authorities, civil society, and uh, if it comes to, um, and, and then stakeholder groups to whom all of this reconstruction will be, uh, who will be the end beneficiaries. Uh, so yeah, politics should be there, and I think EU is the, the actor that can bring this uh, consultations on a very, uh, on the algen here, on the same level of ice. Yeah. So, uh, could, one thing, could we the, connect one other question okay, yeah. be, uh, just before, uh, because right. Klaus also wanted to say something, just and then we adjourn. actually also have to, adjourn come to a close relatively yeah. soon, but... Klaus Adam, University of Mannheim. So you laid out the conditions that would sort of make a post-war Ukraine uh, recovery and reconstruction more likely or more successful. So I just wonder, you know, what 
we are still in the midst of war, and obviously we are hoping for the Russian army to collapse, but it's proved to be very difficult. So how much would you think that the clean victory that sort of reinstates the borders of 2014 is actually a precondition for having a successful um, recovery and reconstruction of Ukraine? I mean, we could easily imagine a messy situation where parts of the country remains occupied, mm -hmm. and uh, that would create various sorts of instabilities, political and other. And so how much do you think uh, this is really a precondition for successful um, recovery? I think, first of all, I say, uh, the history of the world, and particularly history, thinking about World War I, there's nothing more we should be more fr frightened of it than when we start hoping for a decisive military victory, because much, decis I just, Ukraine could win a decisive military victory next week, it's possible, uh, but hopes of decisive military victories are on, typically on both sides of a war, and, and, uh, and there's no, we've, the worst damage in, in, in to civilization has been done when, when two great nations were in conflict and both hoping for next week a decisive military victory against each other. Uh, I do hope for a decisive military victory for the Ukrainian army. I'm a supporter of Ukraine, and that, and, but uh, but I but I pinch myself about that. I think um, a good environment for the the real condition for the best hope for 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 a peaceful Ukraine uh, is a change in the Kremlin's attitude, and the Kremlin the Kremlin is telling its people. They, must, they should be willing to make any sacrifice. This isn't the kind of propaganda that's coming out of, out of Russian state TV now. That Rus the Russian people should tighten their belts and give up all material goods for, uh, to, 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 to divert more to, to building a war machine that can utterly destroy Ukraine. And as long as they are telling, the, because they are committed to telling those lies to their people, Ukraine will be in serious danger. Uh, obviously, the, 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 there is a, the, so I'm not saying that Putin has to ch fall from power, although I don't, I, it seems unlikely that he would change his tune on this question, but he could. I mean, what I, he can lie to his people and say, whatever I said yesterday, that hey, we can really live with a democratic Ukraine, no problem. He could say that, and, and, and his, his, his propagandists would support it. Uh, so, uh, so uh, but it, I know it's not likely, but the, I want to say more Yes, Ukraine wants its territory back and it's right. Uh, I would suggest another goal is also the end of Russian political, internal political pressure to try to build a, to, 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 to turn a, the whole country into, into a machine for, for making um, war on Ukraine. And I should say, when people talk about corruption, of course there's corruption in Ukraine, but Russian corruption is Ukraine's secret weapon because obviously there's much more corruption in military procurement in Russia, and God bless them, let them, let them keep stealing a large fraction of it, but it's dangerous. I would say that um, a likely scenario that ends the war, speaking realistically, setting aside my hopes for, these are what I would hope for, these are the two things I hope for most, a decisive military victory and or uh, a change in the way Russia talks about Ukraine. They, they say, oh, just give us Donbass and Crimea, and of course we can live with that. Uh, if they did that, 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 then the rest of Ukraine could have a very successful trajectory. Without that, it can still have a very successful trajectory, but there'll be high defense expenditures, and Israel is a good example of a, of a besieged country that, that devoted a large fraction of its resources to defense, but managed to, to grow uh, given peace. Uh, and the, 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 uh, the, the plans for the Ukraine facility include talk about encouraging investment in Ukraine that, that is, is existing under threat of Russian attack by offering insurance to investors uh, against the, the, po the possible loss due to a future Russian war. Um, and uh, that will create connection if in the event of that second war, that that will make it a much more complicated international situation, but but the the most likely path is one of of growth. And that is a good way of encouraging international investment in Ukraine, uh, in a Ukraine that exists 
thankfully with, with, with a large fraction of its original territory intact, and, but under military pressure from a highly aggressive, uh, uh, highly hostile uh, Russian government. Um, I think that, that, can be, that is, can be a scenario, with or without foreign investment, the people of Ukraine themselves, given peace and given uh, substantial assistance, can uh, grow, and I think that's a realistic hope. Uh, that be, they will have a very large defense expenditure, but they will spend that money extremely well, and the, if they're confronted with a Russia that, ti that tightens its belt and taxes its people, thankfully the, the logic of Putin's political regime is, is that he allows his, his cronies to steal lots from the government budget, and uh, they will waste a large fraction of that, and, and that, that can be a scenario I wish, I wish for a better scenario, but that's... A, Maybe if I make, uh, make a few more points. Yeah. Uh, I think it's very important. So the, the, uh, the victory of Ukraine, not what we call a military victory, it doesn't have to be the precluding for the beginning of the recovery. We need a fast recovery. It is yes. already now, and the, the uh, Ukraine controls the biggest part of its territory, which is, let's say, it's not in the undangerous, but it is possible to use the insurance and so on. It is possible to develop businesses. And if the, United, uh, if the uh, European Union is able to support Ukraine in the transformation, that is what we want from the recovery, transformation of uh, Ukraine, then this is what we can start yesterday, actually. Uh, and this has been started and the European Union is already providing uh, some of their supports and basic, by the way, the German Development Bank is already supporting even some housing, the KfW Bank. On the other hand, we have to know that the, the goal of international foreign assistance has to be that Ukraine returns to its, uh, gets a just peace. Just peace is not just getting to the territories of the 1991, which are all, everybody uh, seems to agree that this is our, our uh, sovereign territory, but also reparations, also the uh, uh, punishment of the crimes, uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, of the war crimes by Russia, and uh, more other things. And uh, that would what the just peace was, would look to Ukraine. And maybe I know we are short of time, but I would like to draw your attention that Ukraine fights in a very unconventional way, so we, we shouldn't expect a, a victory of uh, kind of a 1945 style. Uh, maybe it's just enough to put Russian army so much uh, uh, hidden in Crimea that they cannot move any, anywhere more, and that would be enough. I'm just saying that we can be a bit more creative here. So, and, and I think what we all should on our, where, wherever we have influence, we should be thinking, how do we make sure that Ukraine wins faster than longer? Because every day of war is yeah. more people dying. Yeah. But we also cannot be realistic, as some people tell us, that we should give up some territories because people die there too. There is a lot of uh, evidence of the torture chambers, of deportations of children, the killings of children and other war crimes. So that is also not an option. The only option is how do we put all our energy together to help Ukraine to win faster? And actually one of these is also what bank and industry and finance system can do is to make sure that the Russian money does not corrupt the uh, the, the financial system. And I, I came just back from the UK where this was also discussed and the, and the amount of the Russian influence and the, the uh, inclusion of the Russian elites and their children who have been part of the Russian regime in the UK society are really extraordinary. Uh, so maybe that is this way what we can do on our side in order to help Ukraine attain the victory which we deserve uh, with the deaths of our soldiers. And uh, at the same time, recovery can and should start already now where that makes sense, of course. Can I just, I take one, you will, this is one, one important criticism I'm, I have, which is joint work, but I was responsible for the title. And you've just suggested that, uh, that the first word in the title is wrong. I should have, instead, uh, the first word was post-war and I could have simply said, it, perhaps the title should be Reconstruction Assistance and Local Governments in Ukraine. It, 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 the project may begin even before a, a hope for post-war begins. Yes, so thank, thank, you, thank you so much. I think uh, you have given us uh, so much food for thought. You're, of course, uh, both part of the 
already now ongoing uh, reconstruction. Uh, we uh, value very highly that uh, you put your intellectual power into, uh, into thinking uh, about this. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you uh, for being here today for in enriching us with, uh, with your uh, work and, and your thoughts. It was a real pleasure to have you here. I'm very happy that we devoted this session yes. to Ukraine, which is in, in all of our minds. We very much hope that the outcome will be what you described as the, as the ideal scenario. Uh, here at the ECB, um, uh, we, uh, we try to also help uh, as, as much as we can uh, within our uh, remit. But if you have ideas there, what we could uh, do more, of course, we're very open to that. So thank you very much. Thank you uh, all uh, uh, for coming. We're now going to, um, to move uh, to, to dinner. There will be people guiding us. And uh, so after a long, I think, very interesting day, we have uh, deserved a nice dinner. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>